right. So we have an hour together. Let's make the most of it as usual, as usual. Thinking just for this hour, we're going to listen, analyze, contemplate, internalize these ideas, even a, a half a percent of them. And if it makes sense, put it into practice. That's the bottom line, you know. It's like recipes. Recipes to just to make a cake. So I was thinking today, and I think about this a lot because we can, I can see that because we all have this huge attachment to be approved of and to be good girls and boys. In the end, we don't even know what we want. We're too scared. It's really fascinating this. You know, we don't know what we want. Now we know ourselves, if you have to, if you have to take one step in any direction, you have to know what you want, don't you? How is everybody? I'm jumping in, leaping in all these thoughts of mine. Everyone's okay? No mental breakdowns? Isla in Scotland's all right. Julian, Trish. Anyway, let's think about this one. Um, especially in relationships and in jobs and mummies and daddies and all our relationships in the world, you know? And because we're all, I mean, this is the deepest attachment. They don't really talk about it much until you get to the Bodhisattva path. And they talk about this weird phrase they use. They talk about the eight worldly dharmas. It's such an odd one. When I know when I first heard, I thought, what are they talking about? How boring. It's taken me years to think about it. But basically it's, it's attachment at a really primordial level, a very pervasive level, you know? And one of them, there's sort of four pairs of them. And this one, they say, this is the last one to go. This is the most primordial and the hardest to identify in our mind. It's the deepest kind of, it's, it's the closest to ego grasping. It's the closest to this neurotic wrong sense of self we have. Because we, because you see the irony of it, the irony of ego grasping is that we think we're horrible. We think we're hopeless. We don't think they're anybody. There's no awareness. There's no consciousness. There's no sense of being anything. And then we have this enormous attachment, which is dissatisfaction with what I am. And then we're kind of just looking out there for something to make us happy, you know? And then, but, but the deepest one is this yearning, this craving this real craving for other people to smile at me and let me know that I'm okay. Or even more simple, it almost seems too shocking, we have this intense craving to be liked. So we, ought, uh, we never ask that question. We just think it's the most normal thing in the world, don't we? Of course I want to be liked, we say. It's normal. Of course it's normal because we've all got attachment. But where's the problem? What's the problem with that? Attachment, where's the problem with that? You have to ask why you need someone else to approve of you. Why do you need approval of someone, from somebody else? Why do you need someone to look at you and say you're a nice person? Why do you need that? Because you don't believe it yourself. That's why. There's something missing. It's missing inside you. The sense of who you are is missing, literally missing inside us. So we need someone else out there, whoever it is. It could be the dog smiling at us and we'll feel that's approval. We think, well, the dog approves me. I must be okay. I mean, surely this shows how desperately needy, how, we, we say needy, it's a great word needy, but we kind of again think of it just, oh, this poor thing, she's so needy. That's a brilliant word for attachment to what they, what they call attachment to reputation. So because of this, like in a relationship, you know, say you're in love with somebody and you're not sure if the other person's in love with you. So you're going out of your brain, you know, and you're doing everything you can to, you're scared of upsetting them. You're really scared to upset them. You're scared they might leave you. You're scared, you don't know. And you keep trying to find out what do they want? You, and you're acting like it's kindness. Many relationships are like this. It's called, in the West, we call it um, codependent. It's when both of you are like that. But when there's one of you like that, all you're doing is watching the other person like a hawk, every second watching and checking that what you do and say and how you behave, that they're approving of it. And then you think, oh, phew, I must be okay. So you, this is the source of insanity. And we all live our lives like this. Because the irony of attachment and ego grasping is we don't think we're anything. The more ego grasping there is, the less awareness, the less self-consciousness, the less awareness of who we are. So when this attachment is rampant, we just go mad, literally go mad, so that we don't know what we want. So what do you want, you'll say to that person. And all they'll do is worry about what the other person thinks. If they dare to say what they want, they want to make sure the other person wants it before they say, I want it. So we go crazy. And this is what attachment is. And so we're completely a disaster, you know. So in our ordinary life, I remember reading, I always quote this, years ago, some, some nurse in England, Australian nurse or something, she wrote a book. She did blogs first. She worked with the dying. And then she wrote a book, The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. And the greatest regret was your kind of your wasted life that I didn't that I didn't do what I really felt I wanted to do, what was in my heart, but I did what I thought other people expected of me. That's this attachment. 
And that even the, lama, the lamas would say the worst, the pain, the greatest pain at the time of death, apart from all your fears, is your wasted life. You waste your regrets about what you didn't do that you felt you should do. And of course, they're talking about your practice, you know. So we have to know, I mean, this is the thing, we have to know what we want. Now, you might want to kill somebody. You just, you've got to know it first. And that's the problem. Most, most of us don't even know what we want. And suddenly you just got, there's your dead husband. Oh, what happened? I killed him. You didn't even know it was in there because we, we don't look at our minds, you know. So you've got to know what your mind is thinking. And then, we, and then if it is something that we do want, like, you know, someone rings you up, your friend rings you up. Oh, you know, Lama's over teaching in Paris, this very special text next weekend. Would you like to come? You know, and you live in Santa Fe. And you'll laugh and say, don't be ridiculous. How can I go to Paris next weekend? You'll say. And you'll think of all, and immediately you'll think, no, my husband won't approve. I can't possibly do it. It'll be too much money. I can't get a credit card. I can't possibly do it. So 47 things already arise in your mind before you're even able to say, I'd want to do it. You have to first state, I want to do it. If you don't want to do it, say it. Then you have to then hang up the phone. There's no problem. But you've got to first know, what do I want? But we're too scared to even say, I want that. Or what we do first is think of all the obstacles, all the things that prevent us from doing it, or even afraid of the person approving. Mainly it's that one. What do the people think? I couldn't do that. How can I possibly put that on my credit card? It just seems, you know, because we live in fear of upsetting people. We think it's called kindness, you know. We think it's called kindness. I'm being so kind to my husband. But you're terrified of what he thinks. We don't think we are. Well. Why don't you leave that? Because I mean, there's a vague kind of there's, there's people out there, and we can't even articulate it. I mean, it starts with being God, then it starts with mummy, and then daddy, and then next door neighbors. Because when we're, we're desperate to be seen as a good girl, and then walk down the street, and someone looks at it mean, we think, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? So we're trying to make everyone happy, and we think it's kindness. It's very wicked. It's not kindness at all. It's fear of being disapproved of. So it can also keep us in line. It's useful. It can be virtue in that, having some sense of consciousness, some consciousness, some awareness, and not just walk around like some mean, self-centered person doing what you want. That's not the implication here. So it's being aware of what do you want. You've, you've got to be aware of what you want. You want do you want to get married? And you're too scared to say yes because you're not sure what, whether he wants it. Well, I'm not sure if he really wants I didn't ask you whether he wants it. Do you want it? And we're even too scared to say it. We, we are all like this, but we don't know we're like this. Because we, 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 we would never think that we are worried about what people think of us. But the more we see our mind, the more we're noticing all the time there's a conversation in our mind. There's this constant dialogue in our mind. So if all the time you're thinking about something you just did and you're telling someone about it, that's this attachment. If you're, if you're having a conversation in your head and distressed because the person didn't approve of it and you're trying to tell them about it and explain it, because we're always having these dialogues in our head with other people because we're not certain ourselves what we want. Our mind's always distressed, you know, and we don't even notice it. It's so painful, it takes us a while of really being conscious of our minds to even notice this constant, constant, constant anxiety about what people think of me. It's very profound, it's very shocking, but it's very hard to see it. You know? I mean, someone might think, oh, I do what I like. I do what I like. I'm a very self-centered person. They would do what they like, and they don't care what people think. But right inside, they're brokenhearted. And they're kind of defending themselves, you know. Because we all desperately want people to like us. This is the most fundamental attachment. It's the most fundamental primordial attachment. And why we have it is because, I mean, Lami Yeshi would say we're all schizophrenic. And he, people are shocked by that because it's a very serious name to give somebody in this culture. But it's dualistic. There's a poor self-pity, unhappy, distressed, unaware me here and all the world out there, you know. And we're trying to get the world somehow to come in and sort of fill us up. And the deepest one, more than sex, more than drugs, more than money, more than power, more than beauty, more than things, is this one of other people shining back to me, kind of smiling back at me. People who like a, sh you know, arrogant people, you don't, th they don't think that they care about what people think, but they're desperate for what people think. And as soon as they're not, a, they're not, a, they're not approved of, they get offended and sort of angry and aggressive, you know. But a shy person, we all feel sorry for, sh are we shy person? We think they're very humble. Oh, shy, she's so shy, you know. Well, no, shy is another aspect of, of being attached to being seen. Because as soon as people look at you, you, you turn bright red or whatever color you are. The blood comes to your face because you're self-conscious. That's attachment to reputation. Because it's too painful for you to think that people are looking at you. 
It's the same type of thing. You know? We've all got it. Join the universe, folks. This is called attachment. But in terms of our daily life, why we're so anguished is because we never can make up why we can't make up our mind about things. Because we we it's not that we don't know it. We don't. We're too scared to say what we want, but we're too terrified of saying it in case she doesn't approve and he doesn't approve and they won't approve and he won't approve and she won't approve. You notice it especially, like especially in like the tyranny of families. I mean, excuse me, families are wonderful, but there's a tyranny of families, and especially when the family, you know, the parents are very powerful. I and mean, certainly in some cultures, it's still like that, where, you know, you just never, it wouldn't ever, a, a person, like I'm thinking of, you know, it doesn't matter what culture, but per, some people, where the family has such incredible hold culturally, a daughter or a son, it would never occur to them to do anything that the parents don't approve of. It just wouldn't even occur. It's like an impossible idea. It would be insane to think of doing something your mother doesn't approve of. It's like dying. That's attachment to reputation. You know. So what this first step is we have to think, what do I want? I have to be brave enough to say it to ourselves. Because if you can't even know what you want, then you can never make any, you just go around in circles, trying to make everyone happy and you go completely crazy. And you see, the thing is with that, people who are like that can also have the aspect of being very kind. There's virtue there. There's virtue in their kindness. They want to make mummy happy. That mummy's helper. There's that, and that's where the, the, the thing in Buddhist psychology, you've got to distinguish between the negative neurotic aspect of something and the, there's a positive aspect. There's one way of saying it. The negative and positive states of mind are completely separate. But there's a way of saying it. Like, for example, you know, let's say an angry person, and that's my kind of person. There's also there's something very good about that kind of mind because we're always finding fault. Look at that, that's wrong and that's wrong. But if you can use that, I'm trying to use that. You see fault and then you go, how can I fix it? That's good, that's good. So that's that's channeling what looks like a negative thought, which is always finding fault. And that's what Martin Luther King always said. Good to find fault, good to see fault. Then you say, what can I do to fix it? That's incredible. But a patient person, patience is an unbelievable quality of welcoming the problems. But the downside of a patient person is passivity. They'll put up with garbage and they shouldn't. An angry person won't put up with anything. So you've got to harness that and make it positive. And the patient person has got to start, stop putting up with things. And how can I fix it? So often patient people, the kind ones, mummy's helpers, you know, they look so kind, so good. They are mummy's helpers, but they don't see the attachment aspect of their mind, the need to be seen as a good girl, the deepest craving to be approved of. And then when you're like that, you get you get treated like a doormat. People use you because you're vulnerable. Attachment makes you vulnerable and weak. So this is why this Buddhist view of the mind is so outrageously clear, you know, so amazing. It takes us quite a while to see it because right now we have all these thoughts mixed together like a big soup in our mind. In our culture, we give them all equal status. Whereas Buddha is a much more radical view. The neuroses... You've got to learn to separate them. You've got to separate the junk from the good stuff, you know, and, and because they've got a very distinct character. And the key job of being a Buddhist, like I repeatedly say, is distinguishing between the, the facts and the fiction, the delusions and the virtues. That is not, not, not how we think in our culture. So psychologically, neuroscience, we do not think like that. So if you're going to try to be a Buddhist, you've got to learn this. Don't just say, oh, yeah, I'm attached. Oh, yes, I'm angry. You've got to be more precise, far more precise. But this neediness, this neediness to be approved of, to be seen, to be smiled at, to be liked. And this is, I mean, look at how we are when we're not. I mean, even just a stranger in the street cannot look at us perfectly and we'll have a panic attack, you know. You're driving the car on the freeway and the guy behind you toots his horn. I mean, in America, it's like you're practically killing someone if you toot the horn. No one ever toots their horn until they want to kill you. Whereas in India, you, you've got to toot your horn. All the trucks ask you to. It's, it's another one of your tools, how to drive. You've got to toot your horn. In America, you, the last thing you'll do is toot your horn. And when you do toot your horn, you're just about ready to kill somebody. That's what happened to me one time when I first came to America, driving my lovely $500 1976 Dodge Dart, this beautiful, long, blue car. I just loved it. A two-door. It was gorgeous. I loved my Dodge Dart. And I remember I didn't know about the, and it's like a boat and you drive, it, it's like a big boat, you know, sort of sw the, the back comes after the front because it's so big. And anyway, I'm driving on this Wrigley Highway in California, Highway 9, all between the Redwoods. And I'm not driving, I'm not driving that fast. I'm getting used to driving on the wrong side of the road and everything. And these cars behind me, and I know I can see these cars behind me. And I, and I don't, and there are these places where you go to, you, you move into these places to the right to let the cars pass. No one will ever toot their horn. They're sitting there. You don't know, you can't see their faces. So you don't know they're impatient. 
So eventually I moved over to the right in one of those places in the car behind me. He screamed to a stop after me. The guy fell onto the street out of, as he opened the car. He was so raging angry. I had absolutely no idea what had happened. And I thought he was having a mental breakdown. And luckily I had my window up. And he came and he just wanted to kill me because he'd been sitting there behind me all this time. And it was, and it was a, a side story. It's not about tattoo. Well, it is about tattoo reputation, but it's not quite. And I was completely gobsmacked. He practically wanted to murder me. He was bright purple in the face. He, and he just, he tooted his horn. I would have known it quite a while ago. Never mind. That's just a, an aside. So back to this one. So, uh, yeah, but on the road, yes. Like you've got a car behind you tooting you. And we freak out. Analyze that. Analyze. Why should you freak out because a car behind you toots their horn? Because they're not approving of you. And you don't even know them. They're a stranger. Think of that. We just go, oh, that's normal. It's not normal. It's called attachment to reputation. So when a person who knows what they're doing and is confident on the road and is accepting what they have to do and they're making their decisions and turning left and turning right and about the car and they're trying to be nice, they're trying to be reasonable, but if other cars don't approve of them, they're not going to get upset. But we've got to grow that. That's got to, that comes from what we call self-confidence is exactly what I'm talking about. Self-confidence is arrogance. Self-confidence is knowing what the hell you are and what you want to do. And then you make a decision because you think it's the most beneficial thing, including leaving your husband with the two children. Now, in the universe, that would be considered the worst crime on the planet for a mother to leave her children. But there's no saying you can't, there's no, you know, if that person knows what they're doing and they've made a decision that it's the best thing for the kids, best thing for the husband, some people do that and get destroyed for the rest of their life. But it's a possibility it was the right thing to do. But we're terrified of upsetting people. We're terrified of people are disapproving all this. And we all just say it's normal. No, it is normal, yeah, but it's mental illness. It's called attachment. And so what it prevents us from doing is ever knowing who I am and what I want. So we just become unconscious, trying to run around trying to please people, wondering and wondering why your kindness isn't making you happy when Buddha says kindness makes you happy because it's riddled with attachment. It's driven by fear. That's why. That's why we have to discriminate between delusions and virtues. That's why we have to know what is it I want. And you might want to kill your father, but you have to know it first. Then, based upon proper ethics, you can make a decision. So you don't do that one, clearly. You've got to first know, what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? We can't even answer that question. Or, and, or the main problem, like I said, you know. And I always use this example in the centres. I remember one centre years ago, when I first ran the prison project, and I remember, you know, I had to really make decisions what to do, because all these people in prison wanting books and there's no money and blah, blah, blah. And we, you began to become some, you get some kind of, you begin to get this clarity. That the first thing you have to say, so what would happen is a letter would come before the center in Brazil. This is my first experience. A letter would come and this person in prison, you could read it, the need was so there, but then desperate for something, you know, so you think, and so he wants a book, let's say. Then, you know, at the time, this is before the prison project started. I was working for Mandela. There was no extra money. I'd look in my pocket, no money. You know, I got a little bit of money every month. There's no special money in the in Mandela. There's no, there's nothing. But I'd look at the letter and I'd see this need. So you'd have to, you had to learn to say, not, oh, and the first thing we say is, no, no, I can't do it. Haven't got the money. Can't do it. Haven't got the money. Which was true. But then the, you could see the need was so strong. So then you'd have to practice thinking. Well, I will do it. I want to give this book. I want, I would like to help this prisoner. I want, what do you want for me? I want to help the prisoner. That had to come on top of, oh, we haven't got the money. You've got to say first, I want to help the prisoner. And then you find the money. But if the first thing you say is, I want, I've got to go, I need, I really like an ice cream. I really want an ice cream. I want an ice cream, you'll say. Then you start to think, oh, what if the doors, what if the shop's closed? Or what if the car breaks down? Or what if it starts snowing? Or what if I get held up by a rapist? Then you're stuck in your house. You're paralyzed. Because all we do is see the obstacles. And that's mostly what holds us back. Come to the, come to the weekend retreat next weekend for me with, with, with in, in Paris, Rubina. The most precious, you know, the most precious empowerment you've wanted all your life. But all you think of is, no, it's not possible. Oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, no, I haven't got the money. Oh, no, what people think. All these, and you block. No, not possible, we'll say. That's how we live our lives, you know. Full of fear about what people think or can't be bothered. Too difficult. We all admire people who do exactly and have this courage to make decisions and sacrifice their lives and do the thing that looks impossible. We admire people like that. So the first step has to be, what do I want? So I remember when I went to this, so when I started running the prison project, thinking we will do it, then we'll find the money. You say what you want first. 
I do. So the thing with the Paris one then, you, you ring me up and it's first, immediately it's ridiculous, it's not possible, don't be absurd, but you say to yourself, and, they, and they'll say, Rabina, actually, what do you want? Do you want to come to Paris? Even we're too scared to think it. So when I was in the center in Brazil, this is 30 years, 25 years ago, and I was the, the very sweet guy running the center, and a uh, very dear, dear man. And he asked me to have a bit of a meeting with all the volunteers so they can help the center grow. Well, I'd learned this already from the prison project, you know, you state what you want. So I said to him, so it's good. I, so I put down, you know, the way to do it in terms of an organization, you get a little budget. So I had expenses and income. Well, you start with the expenses, which means what are you gonna spend? Which means what do you want? So I said, so I, looked at, I looked at the altar and it was a crummy altar with his moldy bowls and no statue. And I said to the, the director, okay, let's start, let's start. You know, let's start. I said, would you like a new statue? Would you like a new statue of the Buddha? And he said, no, 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 we haven't got the money. I said, I understand. Would you like a new statue? No, Rabina, you didn't hear me. We haven't got the money. I said, I understand that. Would you like one? He, it took me five times to say to him, do you want a new statue? Are you hearing my point, people? He couldn't even hear the words that he wanted a new statue. All he could see was the impossibility of a new statue. So all you see is the impossibility of going to Paris for that retreat. All you see is the impossibility of doing that thing because instantly in your mind, he won't, no, 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 no. The 37 reasons are already in the mind. Laziness can't be bothered, too difficult. He won't approve, haven't got the money, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And that's the, the worst kind of laziness. I can't do it, not possible. But we don't even have enough courage to say, I want it. If you don't say what you want first, how can you take the first step? If you don't say what you want first, how can you take the first step? You've got to know you want an ice cream. From there, you then to see if the possibility, and if you can't do it, then fine. But you've got to say, I want an ice cream, not just see all the obstacles. That's what we live our lives doing. And it's the worst kind of laziness because it's saying, or it's seeing all the obstacles and, and our fear of breaking through the obstacles, mostly what people think, you know. The greatest regret, they're so moving. It wasn't this greatest regret of the dying, ordinary people. It wasn't not walking up Mount Everest, that I didn't do what was in my heart. I did what I thought other people expected of me. This is exactly the one I tell you. So it's not, it's not being, and also for us, it's, we, we think it's selfish. We're scared to think, what do I want? But you've got to know whether it's negative or positive, and then you make a decision about it. You might, you have to say you want an ice cream first. Then the next step is let's see if we can accomplish it. You've got to say, I, yes, I want to go to Paris, but we're even too scared to say I want it because we might be, we don't, we won't be disapproved of. So you never, you never see the possibility. So we never move an inch forward. It is, this is the worst kind of laziness. And this courage really only comes when we've really got some practice under our belt, you know. So of course, on the base, on what, so then the crucial point, of course, here is on what basis do I then decide that what I want is valid? That's the next question. Now, that's the crucial one. Not just because you feel like it. That's where this following my heart sounds nice, but that mightn't always be valid because following your heart just might be following attachment, which is a load of rubbish. So on what basis do we decide that what we have decided we want is valid or not? That's when it becomes dharma. And that's often our nightmare as well. We never know what to decide because we don't know how to judge is that the right thing to do that's the next agony well there's really two precisely two two reasons two motivations that will cover everything it's so simple but we have to think it through there's precisely two reasons two motivations that would be valid anything other than these it's not dharma Therefore, not valid. So, what does that mean? Well, remember, we've got the remember we've got the wisdom wing and the compassion wing, isn't it? So, is it beneficial for me to leave to stay in this job? That is the question. That is what you are trying to establish. You are trying to find out: Do I want to stay in this job, for example, or do I want to stay in this relationship with that bloke? Just example, example, example. You so you, even before you decide if it's what you want, it's even to see the possibility. There's two options, either stay or leave, isn't it? So you're already deciding what you want, either stay or leave. So how you decide is this. The wisdom wing, which is all the work you do to help you become this marvelous, fulfilled, content, wise, courageous, clear person. Which means 
you got to see your attachment and see your jealousy and see your depression and see your fears and your anger and lessen them. So the wisdom wing reason to stay in a job is it will it will help you see your mind. It will, the, the same with a relationship, especially the relationship one. I mean, it's a relationship with the boss, same thing. Will this be in this? Is there some, is there, first of all, there's some, I mean, we say that they talk about there's some karma there between you. That's very hard for us to see. There's been there's some dynamic there, you know? Because if there's no karma there, you wouldn't even, you, you, you can't be in that job. It's not possible. There's got to be some karma there to be there, to force you to even, to drive you to the job or to drive you to that relationship. Now, the usual reason, this is the, this is the point now where about what is following your heart can be attachment. The usual reason we stay in a relationship is because it suits our attachment. The, you know, the usual reason we stay in a job is because it suits our attachment. So when it stops suiting our attachment, we get angry, we get distressed, and then we don't, we, we don't like it. But then we can't even make the decision to leave because we're too scared of what people think. So this is the, the, the courageous view. Is this job useful for me, for me, just for me right now? Or the relationship, okay, the relationship, put the relationship with the boyfriend or whatever it is. If it helps you work on your attachment, work on your anger, work on your self-centeredness, work on your delusions, then it's a perfect relationship for you. Oh, wow, amazing. If you're in that job where you, you know, you're learning accountancy, let's say, but you can't stand the people, but they're good accountants, then for sure, if accountancy with the wish to be a benefit to others is what you're trying to learn, it's the best job to have. Just because you don't like the people, just because they don't approve of you, that's just attachment. Come on. This is when we become courageous. Now, in the relationship, you also think, is there some benefit to this other person? Am I being beneficial to this person? That could either mean you're good for his mind or you're, being able, you're practicing kindness. You're practicing not following your attachment. Then it's a valid relationship. There's something to learn there. Amazing. Wow. Go for it. Then that's what I want. And then when you're ready for it, when there's no longer anything left there, you know it's finished. It's over. So you say, goodbye, I'm leaving because you know it's the most beneficial thing to do. So this is why his holiness, it sounds very broad, but it's very powerful, you know. He'd always say, always aspire to do what is most beneficial. Now, the first thing we think is, but how do I know what's beneficial? Well, we don't. We're not clairvoyant. But what we've got to understand is the big difference in having the aspiration, may I do what is most beneficial. We don't think there's much benefit in an aspiration. It just sounds like crossing your fingers. But everything exists on the tip of the wish. This is the meaning of karma. May I? May I? May I go to Paris if it is most beneficial? You'd say that. You're not sure yet, but you'd think, I'd love to go to Paris. You've got to first say that, even though it looks absurd. You've told nobody yet. There's no money. Hubby's there. All the kids are expecting you to be at the house as usual. And you're thinking, without being self-centered, yes, it is an amazing thing. Of course I want to go to Paris. I've been waiting for 20 years for that empowerment. Yes, I want to go to Paris, you say. Then you think, before you even do the analysis of the money and the hubby and the kids, May, if it is beneficial, may I get to Paris for that empowerment? If it is the most beneficial thing, you don't know yet the answer, but the may, it, if it is the most beneficial, is a profound thought to have. And that'll sow the seed for you to then, the, all the conditions to come together. And if it is the conditions, if it is the most beneficial, all the conditions will come together and you'll go to Paris. You clear the way, you know. But if it's not the most beneficial, and that's where you've got to go beyond attachment. We just follow attachment. We think that's following our heart. It's just like a baby. And that's why we have to distinguish attachment from the valid wishes, aspirations. And aspiration isn't attachment. You know, I really want to go to Paris doesn't follow its attachment. But we're scared to say that because we become nihilistic and we think attachment is you can't be strong in what you want. Oh, no, I'm not attached. I don't want anything. That's absurd. That's nihilism. Wanting something is can be aspiration. So you've got to want to get to Paris. You've got to want to have that ice cream. Yeah, for the sake of others, whatever. Then you'll find the method to do it. And if it's most beneficial, may it happen. Then you're really spacious, you know. If we don't have these thoughts, well, we'll just get muddled and then we'll just follow. You know, it's like for me, always the analogy is you're walking on a road and you have no idea where the turnoff is. And it's, it's your road because it's your life, baby. It's your life. And whatever you meet on that road, whatever obstacles that are there, they're your karmic appearance. You created those obstacles. You created those barriers. You created those difficulties. They're yours. 
So what are you going to do? And you don't know where the turnoff is. Should I leave my husband or should I not? Should I become a nun or should I not? Should I go to that empowerment or should I not? We're always having these agonizing decisions, always deciding, or even as simple as someone rings you up, really as simple as this, someone calls you up for dinner. You really should think to always do what's most beneficial. That's if you've got bodhisattva vows. You don't just follow your feelings. That's what we always do. We spend our lives following our feelings. It's like, in other words, you're walking on your path, your road, and a pretty road comes along. Oh, that looks cute. I'll go there. We get lost. We completely get lost because we follow attachment. But if you follow the right thing to do with the bodhisattva vows, and a person calls you up for dinner, and you just check, is it most beneficial? And if it's the best thing for that person, you mightn't feel like it. You'll say, yes, I'd love to come for dinner. So this, this is why the bodhisattva vows are so powerful. They guide you, you know, they guide you. But from big, the big life decisions, many people never can make their life decisions. That's paralyzed. So that's why so many people live in nightmarish relationships, nightmarish jobs, going mad. Look at the world, you know. And then die with regret of a wasted life. First step has to be, what do I want? Then you check if it's beneficial. And then you put the conditions together. And if it doesn't happen, you accept. And if it does, keep moving. This is how you live your life. You know? Otherwise, we're just a mess. And you need courage. Because you're guaranteed you're not going to make everyone happy. I promise. And you can see the really good girls and good boys. I know so many people like that. Go mad trying to... F figure out what everybody else wants and, and it can be incredible kindness but they're lacking wisdom incredible kindness to try to say and do whatever what makes everybody happy you can literally lose your mind doing that if it's not mixed with wisdom you go mad because you cannot make everybody happy it is an impossibility and it's not even your job you've got to want to make people happy there's a big difference the, the bodhisattva aspect is i want people to be happy it is my job to make them happy Because they've got to, it's like tennis. They've got to play with you. They've got to hit the ball back. It's got, they've got to play their role. So if you expect, this is the point. This is the point. Now, this is the point. We take as proof of our success in helping somebody that they, they take our help and they're smiling at us. If they don't take our help and that doesn't help them and they don't smile, we think we've been a failure because we, we didn't get their approval. That's all it is. It's just self-centered. You can't make everyone happy. That's why people in the hospitals and that people are dying like flies, especially these days with COVID-19. And let's say you're an incredibly compassionate nurse, but like everybody, you've got this massive neediness to be seen as a good girl and to be seeing that you're successful. And how we judge success is the number of people who stay alive. This is a really intense point. But you, COVID-19 is so strong and the karma of those people is so strong to die. You then assume your failure. People have been committing suicide because of this. Because of attachment. Because you judge your success on everybody else is all smiling and happy. That's not the valid way to think about it. You made effort. You are kind. That's all you can do. You can't guarantee that, that it will work. The problem is attachment, needing to be seen, to be approved of. We want to run around and fix everybody. Attachment wants to fix everybody. It's a junkie. It just wants to feel nice. And the kindness is also there. There's no, there's no, there's no doubt about that. But it pollutes, the attachment pollutes the kindness. So we've got to have this clarity, you know. And this is not an easy job to see our own minds like this. This is sophisticated work. I'm not saying I know it. This is called wisdom. Compassion is not enough. Being goody-goody is not enough. Being mummy's little helper is not enough. Meaning well is not enough. You've got to have wisdom. And wisdom is clarity that you get from getting your own junk out of the way. And this is what the wisdom wing is about. This is intense, full-on practice. Being kind is easy in comparison with this. I don't know. What do you think? Questions? Ask me some questions for our remaining 40 minutes. Any questions? Any thoughts that come up as a result of that? Rabina, good morning. Good morning. Um, 
actually i i put on the chat i have three questions <laughs> sorry uh, I just, uh, one is how do you heal from regrets of past choices how do you heal from resentment and is there a difference between letting go and surrender Because we're ordinary human beings, Deborah, we have attachment and we have anger and we have fears and we have rubbish. Inevitably, inexorably, naturally, and logically, we make mistakes. Do you agree with that? Okay. So you look back, and this is why the purification practice is so powerful. This purification practice that Lama Zobra says we're insane not to do at the end of every day. The first step is you acknowledge you made, you did dumb things. You, and what you mean by a dumb thing is that you hurt somebody or you made choices that ended up making a mess for you. There's only two choices, isn't there? You hurt yourself. You hurt yourself in both cases, but in some cases you you only, you help, you hurt others and yourself because of it. Or in some cases you just made the wrong choice out of fear or whatever, and you made, you, you kind of wasted your time. So the, regretting that is healthy, but what we tend to do is we go, oh, I'm a bad person, or I shouldn't have done that. And we sink into the the misery of those bad choices. This is totally useless, Deborah. You learn from your mistakes. It's like it, you, you have to, that's what we, we say in our culture, you've got to learn from your mistakes. And that's what purification is. So you first acknowledge, I did do that foolish thing. I did make that mistake. I did hurt that person. I did do this and I did do this. But then you say, how can I fix it? How can I change? So you'd be optimistic, not just, oh, I'm a bad person or I shouldn't have done it. That's worse than useless. That's the first step. Do you understand? Yeah. Now you think, so in the classic Buddhist one, we have this particular this practice that we talk about here. We would then, whom can we, sort of like whom, where's the doctor you can rely upon? Where's the doctor whose medicines you're going to use to fix you? Well, here in Buddhism, we think about the Buddha, but you know, it's up to you to decide. But here, the second step you could say is where you now, if you have harmed others, you now have compassion for those you've harmed. The first one's like compassion for yourself. You understand my point here? You, I, I, was, I did that and I did that out of my own ignorance. At the time, I didn't know any better, but I don't want to harm myself. I don't want to do these dumb, you know, and you, so you regret it. Whom can, so how can I fix it? So then you have compassion. You have compassion for those you've harmed. And then we would, you know, and we would also have the Buddha. We would visualize the Buddha above our head. He's like our doctor. And then third, you would do some kind of practice where you'd, you'd say a mantra, you'd visualize, and you'd do this kind of particular meditation where you would um, try to purify it. You know, you imagine that. Or in your daily life, you simply do the action that's opposite to that. The fourth one is you make a decision to change. So it's a gradual, it's a bit like if you're playing the piano and you play a wrong note. If you keep saying, I played a wrong note, I'm so bad, I played a wrong note, I'm hopeless, I shouldn't have played a wrong note, you can't even move forward. You've got to know you you've got to know you played a wrong note, regret it because you didn't know any better, then look at your music and decide what the right note is, and then keep moving and change. And that's how you move forward and let go of it. Surrender and let go, I've got no idea. They're just terms we make up in our culture. I don't know the literal definitions, but you give up attachment and fear and anger and resentment and, and beat yourself up. That's all useless. So you own your mistakes. You see that you couldn't have done any better at the time. You learn from it. You then have compassion for those you've harmed. Then you make a decision to change. That's how you move forward and learn from your mistakes. So it takes courage, Deborah. Do you understand? Yes. Thank you. Really. We consciously do it, but we love to feel guilty and bad and beat ourselves up. And that's really, anal if we analyze it carefully, Deborah, guilt, I'm a bad person, is actually, is actually based upon not doing what we think mummy said, daddy said, God said, my husband said. So it comes down to, again, you not approved by somebody. So we've got to have the courage to own that we did that. We hurt ourselves and we hurt others and we try and change and move forward. Learn. It's a powerful statement. Learn from your mistakes. But swimming in your mistakes with guilt and resentment and anger and, and, and self-pity is utterly and profoundly useless. You understand? Yes. But it takes real courage every day. And that's why this kind of practice at the end of the day is sort of putting your, checking your day, checking yourself. It's very beneficial, very practical, very precise. You understand? Thank you. Good, Deborah. Thank you. Yes. Your guilt 
Look at guilt, people. It's very powerful. It's, it's still, it's rooted in this wishing to be approved of. Because there you are. You, you, mommy has taught you how to be. You're a good little girl. You do what mommy said. You do what daddy said. You do what God said. So in other words, since we're born, we're filling our mind with what other people say we should do. That's how we learn, isn't it? And there's a good side to that. You've got to learn discipline. You've got to learn how to do things. But the negative side of us, we're terrified of doing that thing because we'll get caught. We don't want to be punished, which means we want to be approved of. So guilt, as soon as you do something naughty, guilt is this, I'm a bad person. And you're looking over your shoulder to see that what mummy's going to criticize you. She could be dead for God's sake. But we've, got, we've internalized mummy. We've internalized God. We've internalized the police and grandma. So we're desperately trying to do what we think they would approve of. We're not even conscious of it like this. But it's all working away in our mind. You know, That's why we've got to work out what do I want? What do I want? What do I think? You've got to know what you think. What do I think? Then you will decide if it's a valid to think it. What do I want and what do I think? They're the same meaning. It's very powerful. It takes courage. Slowly, slowly. Any other questions? Huh? No. Sure? No questions. Nothing there, Mary. Nothing there, Mary. You see, the big problem, the whole problem that's implied by what I'm talking, the entire problem that's implied, which is why it's so difficult, is we are not brought up to be conscious of what we're thinking second by second, which is almost impossible because we have a thousand thoughts a second. But we're not even encouraged to know what we think. We're taught how to think, which we have to in the beginning. We've got to be taught in the beginning. But we all can see that. Let's say you're brought up as a, you know, you're brought up as a certain kind of way of thinking. You think you read about people, let's say, especially people who are brought up in a very fundamentalist environment, like fundamentalist political or fundamentalist religious. I mean, fundamentalist means very rigid, concrete, rigid viewpoints. And because you're so desperate to please the, the thing, yeah, because you're so desperate to please everybody, to please the whole environment, to please the group, to please mummy, to please, to please everybody, it is terrifying. And people talk like that. When you read about people who've left those environments, it took several years of one girl talked about, doesn't matter what her environment was, a very fundamentalist environment. It took her several years to even dare to even consider the possibility that she might just want to leave. That's the fear of what people think. That's how deep this attachment is. you know. And of course, because the conditions are so powerful. I mean, for example, my friends in prison who are gangsters. On the streets, the gangs really, I mean, things are changing now, I heard, you know, but when I first met these Mexican gangsters from Los Angeles 25 years ago, the rigidity of the rules of the gangs is exactly the fundamentalism of these people who are in the capital or the fundamentalist Muslims, fundamentalist Christians, fundamentalist Jews, you name it, you know, fundamentalist communists. I don't care what the policy is, not what the philosophy is. It's, it's the, everybody thinks it, it's completely rock solid. You never see anything outside it and though you don't see any options. So these gangsters brought up in this rigid, precise, I mean, there's no Bible written, but there was like long rules there. All you learn to know how to be, how to behave, how to dress, what tattoo to have, where to have it, what to think. It's this rigidity. And then of course, the fear to go out of that takes enormous courage, but it doesn't occur to you when you're in that. Or even it might occur, but it's just too terrifying to do it. Okay, so we're not maybe in a fundamental religious or political environment. We're not completely, we might be. I mean, some Buddhist centers could be that. And people live in terror of doing what the other people don't approve of. This is always a danger. This is always a danger. But in ordinary families, it's like that. Some more strong than others. First, you've got to be taught. And hopefully your mother's got valid ethics, but then she's also got to encourage you to think, but that's what we're scared of doing because you might make a decision that goes against mummy. And that's what's so horrifying for us. And when we've got a lot of attachment, that's how we manipulate each other. That's how attachment is so wicked. Attachment can look like kindness, but it's so manipulative. We, you know, we talk about control freaks. That's exactly the function of attachment. So an environment, an environment, a fundamentalist gangster environment or communist environment or Buddhist environment or religious environment is exactly that. Or even among a fundamentalist vegans or any group that you identify with. A, a football team, a football, you know, a football um, followers of football. One of the term they use in England, in Australia, we call them barrackers. You barrack for Sydney. 
So if you're fundamentalist in that group, you're apparently thrown out if you dare to go and barrack for another team, you know? So it's the same thing. We're all wanting to be approved of by everybody else. We're looking around to make sure we're in the right mob, you know? We, we need to be in the right mob. We've got to do what everybody approves of. This is the desperate neurotic attachment in us that makes us like lemmings, you know? No awareness, no consciousness, no thought, what do I think? This is a very scary, you know? And then we do think things, we, we follow attachment. So we're just like a mess. We keep making more mess, you know? We keep walking on that road, which is our life, not knowing where the turnoff is, but then we keep following all the cute turnoffs. So we get completely lost. We lose the map, you know? We lose the plot completely. And that's where if we have this aspiration, as his holiness says, may I do what is most beneficial. And as he said, if you can always aspire for the long term, most beneficial, not just the short term. So of course, in Buddhist terms, that means your enlightenment. So in your, in your, in your daily life, what's most beneficial, long term? That means you're prepared to make the tough choices. The, the, the obstacle will come on your road and you know it's the right road. You know you have to get over that obstacle. But if you're following attachment, you want to rush off somewhere else where there's no obstacle, and then you get lost. So it takes courage, which means all of this is a description of trying. This is, this is giving up attachment. I'm speaking about in a very casual way. This is based on understanding what attachment is and how it destroys us. It's not evident to us because we don't talk like this in, the, in our culture, you know. Yeah. Look, time to go again. Look at that. Hour gone like a dream. Come on, you have people. Have to, I've been talking all the time. Come on, ask me some questions. Please ask me some questions. The last yeah. Venerable. Yes, is that Susie? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi, right, go on. Talk to me. So if I'm confused about what I want, I just every day or as often as I think it, just say, how how can I be most beneficial? There's nothing else what? to do other than that. Yeah, or, or if you're not sure what you want. Because it's confused with... Of course it is, totally confused. So <laughs> there's, no point in, there's no point in kind of chewing it like a dog with a bone. You're on a road. It's like you do not know where the turnoff is. It's literally that, isn't it? it it's, mm -hmm. And that it, it might not... So, it, you know, you don't know what decision to make is, is the equivalent of the turnoff. So you don't know what decision to make. So then you, what, you, what's the point? You, you're on this road. I like as an analogy. You're on the road. This is your life, so you've got no choice. And what's in front of you at this second is your life. Exactly what's in front of you, that's what's on, on your road right now. It might be a load of shit. It doesn't matter. That's what's on your road. So you don't know what to do. You don't know. But now you know. You can't go back. You can't stand still. You've got to just keep moving. There's an amazing simple phrase, keep moving. So what do you do? You've got to deal with what's in, you get up in the morning and you do your practice and you think, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know what's best, but I want to do what's most beneficial. I definitely want to do what's most beneficial, which implies for you and everybody else, I want to do what's most beneficial. So then you just keep living your life. You take care of your husband, you take care of your children, you take care of your boss, you do whatever you do that's right in front of you, right that second, that's your job. Attachment wants to go everywhere, but the attachment wants to rush off here and rush off there and rush off there and go back. Everything but do what is right in front of you. And and it, and you, and remembering, once you remember impermanence, Susie, you could drop dead by the end of the day. So then you won't even bother chewing it like a, a dog with a bone. So it's one step at a time. Or you, and I love the saying, you pave your way. So if you do this piece of your job right this second and do the best job you can with what's in front of you, then you, that leads you to the next pavement. And then you need to the next pavement. And then when the time comes, you'll go, aha, uh -huh, the decision is made for itself. You don't even make a decision. Karma takes care. You understand? So yeah. relax and enjoy whatever it is, you know, but do it. You kind of attachment just doesn't want to look at it, doesn't want to think about it, doesn't want to hear it, wants to go back, wants to go forward, wants to go everywhere else. But what is in front of you? And when we understand karma that we created this scenario, no matter what it is, I mean, the painful suffering that's coming, you know, 
A friend of mine just recently just said that the baby they were nearly a, that, that, that they planted in the in the womb of one of the partners is, is it's possible it won't survive. That's the karma you've created right in front of you due to the karma between those three people, the baby in the womb and the two other people, the partners. This is a scenario you've created from the past. You deal with it. You do your best dealing with it. Deal with it every second of the way, not to be attached. Try not to be angry. Try not to blame. One step at a time. One step at a time. One step at a time. Having the courage to know that whatever we meet is our own karmic appearance, as Lama Zopa says. No one's doing it to us. You can't, you know, no one's mm. doing it to us. And then we take responsibility every step of the way. And then we learn to get some courage from this and we do what we have to do. Get some clarity. Clarity comes, you know. Do you understand? Thank you. The key is understanding attachment, which is this junky in us that only wants the nice things. And then when it has a panic attack, when it doesn't get it, that's what throws us and makes us crazy, you know. One step at a time. May I do what's most beneficial? Not sure what it is, but when it when it comes, you'll be ready for it. Because I even think this, if we understand this view of karma, which means we've got these millions of seeds planted in our mind from our own past actions, then then by saying, may I do what's most beneficial, I think that aspiration is like nourishment on the karmic seeds you've already planted, that which will allow those that will be the most beneficial to manifest in front of you. But if you keep, I mean, obviously, if you keep saying, I want to get the job with the most money, I want to get the job with the most money, I'm not being critical, you'll get the job with the most money, inevitably, it'll lead you to it. If I, I want the prettiest girlfriend, I want the prettiest girlfriend, that'll lead you to it. You'll, you'll, you'll find the pretty one. But if I want to do what's most beneficial, that will be the one that'll come and you'll make the tough choices because it's the most beneficial. Mm. You get courageous, you become strong and clear. And then you, and that's the biggest thought you could have. And you'll whiz yourself to enlightenment if you follow that. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, sweetheart. Thank you so much. And Borubina, we have two Thanks. people asking questions Good. in the chat. Yeah. When, forgive me, I don't know how to say her name. Maybe it's Ray or Re. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, Ray. Okay. Um, so she's asking, um, is compassion the difference between confidence and arrogance? And is the sensation between attachment and quote unquote right desire easily felt in the body, the spacious body? I'm completely lost. I can't answer questions like I've got nothing to do with the body. I don't know what to say. I, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I don't know how to answer the questions in relation to the body. I can only talk about the mind. Some people have a, lot, a strong connection with their body and because the mind and the body are intimately connected. But I think I can only talk about the mind. So if you could re, I'd love to answer your question, Ray, if you can rephrase it for me in terms of just your mind. Not take the, keep the body out of it if you can. I'm not trying to be silly. Are you hearing me? Open, open up your mic and just talk to me, darling. Just say yeah, that. I guess I feel like for, sometimes the body has a sense of clarity that my mind will get, get entangled between um, desire, like preference and desire, if that makes sense. Like that, I what said. do I want versus like my so I think, first of all, what I'm, in, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from your question is when I say mind, you're thinking rational, clear, you know, and I am talking rational, but that also includes thinking, that also includes compassion. That also includes compassion. I can't say the body part. I don't talk that way. Some people do, but I can't answer that way. It just would confuse me. So, thinking in the buddhist approach if you, you've got to know what your thoughts are and that you see we often think thoughts is one thing and then feelings somehow are more valid and they're more um, but there's not a the, the thing here is attachment is coming down to a thought anger comes down to a thought compassion and love come down to thoughts as well so when, that's why in the buddhist approach we have to go beyond the body beyond the feelings and get to the bare bones of the of of the of, of the thought behind the anger anger says how dare you do that to me it's a sense of self-righteousness attachment is what do i want compassion is what's best how can i be of benefit to others you can articulate them as simple words so we've got to get in touch with that part so then your first part was self-confidence and what what did you say Compassion is what? Is compassion the difference between confidence and arrogance? Confident. Okay, what's confidence for you? Conf confidence is that like embodied sensation of rightness. Oh, see, I can't say the embodied part. But you want to say it that way? That's perfectly fine, darling. Right, meaning your con so confidence means you know what you want and you know it's valid. Is that what you're saying? I mean, you can be confident and know you can kill somebody very well. That's called confidence, but that's not what we're discussing here. We're talking about confidence in something that is ethical and valid, not attachment and anger and neurosis and self-centeredness. 
That's a Buddhist way of putting it. Self-confidence is a valid and incredible quality of being content with who you are and you're clear. And it's, but all of the assumption here is it's rooted in good ethics. You can be confident. We would say this in the West, but you want to, you're confident you can steal all that money. That's not what we're discussing here. There's a big difference in Buddhism between the neurotic, deluded, eye-based, fear-based states of mind and the positive, virtuous, ethical, reasonable states of mind. So there's always an assumption here that confidence, self-confidence in this is coming from the appropriate place inside you that's useful for you and useful for others. And then arrogance is, is completely deluded and just completely deluded. The arrogance is, is like wrong confidence. Self-confidence using it in this way is the appropriate confidence. Compassion is something completely different. Compassion is what can I do to help others? That's when you put yourself together, the Buddhist approach is when you're more reasonable and ethical and steady and know what you want and have courage and don't follow attachment and don't follow anger and don't follow fears, that's you are the beneficiary. Now you can help others. Compassion is what can I do to help others? And that comes from that comes from proper self-confidence and knowing what you want. Because if you are just running around helping others based on being mummy's helper, which means it's helping others driven by attachment and need to be seen to be a good girl, that'll make a mess. Kind of, are we communicating in using yeah. my okay. yeah. I because I, uh, I guess like sometimes that confidence arrogance um blur comes at the oh yeah because like I guess what I really admire about you is like how did you get that mastery over the top of your range like no, and and have that discernment within that high that high higher part of the range to know like when oh when have I gone too far and when yeah, exactly. I think all, I, all I'm doing is speaking Buddhist psychology, but in a very down to earth way. So for me, the basis of all this is the clear presentation of the Buddha's view of the mind that distinguishes radically and clearly between the neurotic, eye based, fear based, miserable, painful states of mind and the clear, valid, reasonable, ethical, appropriate states of mind. They're the, they're the words we will understand. And they're all mixed together like a big soup right now, Ray. And that's the job of being a Buddhist. That's the essential job of being a Buddhist because Buddha says he's discovered that the neurotic ones are not an integral to who we are and we can lessen them and we can grow the positive ones. It's a very conscious, conscious day-by-day -day job, internal job of distinguishing. That's the job. That's what you mean by those words you were using, body, blah, blah, blah. I don't use those words, but it's effectively that. And some clarity comes. It's not just hit and miss. It's not just cross your fingers. It's not just using your intuition. You see your mind in a very crystal clear way, more subtly than the way we talk in modern psychology. Do you understand? That's the Buddhist approach, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ray. So helpful. It's time to go home. We have one more question, Venerable Rubina. Okay. If you. Um, it's from Rochelle, and she's asking when you know what Who you're doing. Who's asking it? Rochelle. Rochelle. Hello, yeah. sweetheart. How are you, Rochelle? She wants darling? to ask it herself. I'm not I'd sure. like her to, yes. She's my ancient friend. Or oh, she's not ancient. She just we've been friends for years. Go, oh, sweetheart. Um, so when you know what you're attached to, what can you do specifically on a daily moment by moment basis to release the attachment specifically yeah. Yeah. to it? Well, it's it's a really good point. There are there are many, there are many um, if it's a person, if it's a person, let's say. Then it gets more tricky because if it's a cake, then cake doesn't mind if you shove it in the mouth and you know eat it up for breakfast. But people don't like being eaten up for breakfast. So if it's a person or a, a person, let's say, then recognize that the attachment is coming from our own neediness and our own lack. That's a really good way to put it. attachment is coming from our own lack, Rochelle. We don't think it's that. It's coming from I'm not enough, so I have to have that person to bolster me. That's really what attachment is saying. And then we need them to do what we want. We try to control them. We mightn't think it so bluntly, but that's what attachment, look at our mummies, look, look at our daddies, look at, look at anybody we see a messy relationship that's coming from then, because especially with a child or with partners, attachment even extends out and we actually think is even an extension of me. They belong to me, they're me and they're mine. We get all that. That's all these aspects of attachment. And just be conscious of it and then recognize that it's a separate person there and give, give them the space to know what they want and know what they think and that kind of thing, whether it's your daughter or whether it's your beloved, you know, or whether it's your mother even. It's, it's, I mean, there's many, many aspects to it, but it's seeing it's coming from our own unhappy place. Try and recognize that. And then it, it puts its tentacles out and tries to make everything nice that suits me. That's what attachment's job is, to make everything the way I want it. It's very subtle, we can't see it. Often we can see it more clearly in other people, but then we can learn from it ourselves. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's the it's that th the 
fine line between uh, being compassionate and putting other need other person's needs first. Yes. And like the wisdom to know the difference between that compassion That's and right. attachment. Yeah, so in other words, the good girl one is a, lots of compassion, really all the time looking at the other person, what do they need, how can I help them? But what we don't notice is our own satis our own neediness gets fulfilled by that because if they if we are a lovely girl and they approve of me, our mummy's little helper, then I'll be a really nice person. But then that's when we get hurt. That's when we can get used and manipulated and treated like a doormat because we don't see this other needy attachment side. It's very tricky, Rochelle. Different people's attachment works in different ways. The good girl mode is you run around being mummy's helper. I'm such a good person. I'm helping mummy. And you are. You're always putting the other person first. But in the end, they use you and manipulate you because there's a weakness there, which is your own neediness to be seen as a good girl. We've got to distinguish those two parts. Now, other people, like I look at one of my sisters, she's more like that. I'm more like the bossy, the naughty girl who didn't, who wasn't mummy's helper, but also wanted to be needed and approved of, but would end up hurting people getting what I wanted all the time. So it's, it's different aspects, but we've all got the same, all got the neediness to get what I want. Some people use helping others as a method and, we've, and helping others is better than nothing. You know, it's fantastic, but we've got to rid, rid the, the neediness out of it because every, to always do what the other person wants might be the best thing. Might say, no, you, it's okay, darling. I can't do it now. I'm busy or something like that. And that's wisdom because we're craving the other person to always look back at us and think we're lovely. And that often motivates our being compassionate. It's very tricky. You understand? Yeah, it feels good to take care of other people at a high level, and I, I think absolutely, that's absolutely, that's, that's right. My own attachment, but what? I'm feeding my own attachment. It doesn't follow. It can be what's most beneficial for the other person, but that also includes doing something for the other person when you don't want to do it. That's when it's giving up attachment. If it just suits your needs every time, that's what codependence is. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So what is it when you do something when you don't want to? Can you say that piece? That's, that's very, that can, but not, not being a martyr. Oh, all right. I'll help you. I don't want to do it. No, in your own mind, you decide they want to go to the movies. You'd rather watch and you just decide, okay, I'll do what they want. Nothing wrong with that. And, and you don't do it resentfully. You say, sure, honey, I'd love to go to the movies and you do it. You give up your own needs. Other times you, it's, it's best did you say, no, not today, darling? We've got to have that wisdom, Rochelle. It doesn't come easily. And that comes from this, con this continuity every day of some practice, being aware of our own mind, you know, being very conscious. And the thing, the key, one, one key is, when it's the delusions, when it's attachment or, or whatever, it's not comfortable. It's nervous. When it's genuine virtue, when it's good, it's comfortable. It's clean. It's not unhappy. Do you understand? Yes, thank you. Good, darling. Thanks, Rochelle. Well, that's it then, isn't it? Time to go. Gone like a dream as usual. Thank you, Petals. Thank you so much. Be happy. Keep moving. Never give up. Everybody doing your own thing on your own path. One step at a time. Pave the way and go one step at a time and never give up. They're the sayings I like. Never give up. One step at a time. And I love pave the way. Attachment always looks forward to the sixth or seventh pavement. Meanwhile, you make a mess of this pavement. You've got to pave the way. It's a profound statement. Make this piece beautiful. It leads to the next. It leads to the next. It's dependent arising. It unfolds in front of you. And know you can do it. And get to know what you think. Then decide if it's valid. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Much love.